Adding to our thoughts on myth, uh, in our last lecture we looked at some ancient views on myth and found lots of complex and interesting ideas. Uh, well, that tradition carries forward into the modern era. Uh, and in a course on antiquity, uh, the modern era is actually defined a little bit differently than it is in uh, common everyday speech. Uh, anything in the modern era counts as a renaissance and forward uh, for our course. Uh, throughout the Middle Ages, uh, the ideas of euhemerism and allegorism were especially important uh, for those that uh, read these ancient myths and uh, they, they had a different kind of uh, value during that time. Uh, we had medieval churchmen who read them uh, who were interested in these ancient tales uh, as a, uh, maybe a bit of erudition to carry around. Uh, they gave them the term uh, uh, fabulae, that's the plural of the Greek fabu, or sorry, the Latin uh, fabula, uh, which is a, a story or a tale. Uh, the, the Roman word means something like uh, a story, a tale, a tall tale, uh, not something that you would spend a lot of time trying to find deep truths in. If it did have any uh, hidden ideas, it would be a little nugget of wisdom, uh, the kind of thing you might hear in an Aesop's fable. Uh, and these uh, fabulae were something that they had some of these medieval churchmen had some interest in and they carried around and looked at them um, but uh, not a lot of theoretical ideas developed out of there much more uh, they had a much stronger draw for the great minds of the day uh, in uh, an authoritative what in their view was an authoritative uh, Christian version of the Bible uh, they spent a lot of time thinking about that uh, but these were ancient uh, Greek and Roman tales did survive and stick around uh, under this name of fabulae. Now, uh, things changed a good little bit when a figure named Bernard de Fontenelle, whose dates are 1657 uh, to 1757, came along and uh, had a look at some of these stories. Uh, he was interested, like uh, some of his uh, contemporaries, uh, in, in these stories as a kind of nice stories to have around that were fun to hear and maybe a little racy at times but you know still good enough to have around uh, but Fontenelle had some further views too he looked very closely at them and in his view uh, the myths actually grow up um, as a uh, reaction uh, of early early humans to the uh, natural environment that surrounds them uh, they are in his view an attempt to explain otherwise difficult to understand strange features of our natural world. So some strange outcropping of a mountain, a very dramatic valley, uh, perhaps a, a thunder or lightning. These things, Fontenelle said, required that ancient humans develop some explanation. Uh, and when they were uh, uh, in fear of the world around them or found strange the world around them uh, they tried to develop these explanations in the language they knew how and that was the language of myth so according to Fontenelle myths are attempts to explain and they're attempts to explain strange features of the natural landscape early human beings according to this uh, 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 narrative that he was drawing are kind of like you and I they try to do something like you and I are doing. They try to do science to explain the world, but they're working from a very limited data set and also their brains work in a particular kind of mythic way so they don't come up with the kind of scientific explanations that we have. Uh, myth is an attempt at science and it's best seen as a kind of proto-science or a bad science. It doesn't quite work right, but the impulse that it generates it is similar to the impulse that we modern human beings we modern ones living in the 17th and 18th century, um, along with Fontenelle, we modern human beings already exhibit in our scientific knowledge. Advancing from here, uh, some views of the High Enlightenment. We'll take a figure called David Hume. Here, done up in Greek garb. I uh, thought that might be appropriate. Hume's dates are 1711 to 1776, a fateful year. Um, and Hume, Hume has some interesting ideas on myth that he passed down. Uh, I'm just going to highlight one aspect of it. Uh, Hume is characteristic of an Enlightenment, let's say, impatience with a mythic mentality. Uh, there is a sense in uh, many figures in the Enlightenment that what's happening around them during their time is something phenomenal. That there is a birth of rational thinking and there's an expunging of old ways of thought that don't measure up to rationalism. In this story, the concept of myth takes, decidedly takes a back seat 
it gets lumped in with these earlier mentalities uh, that our rational minds, we developing enlightenment human beings, our rational minds are finally leaving behind. Uh, we're casting it aside and developing new scientific ways of thinking. Uh, so for Hume, uh, as well as for others in the Enlightenment, uh, myth was not a source of great interest. It was thought to be uh, the result of fearful human beings making up stories uh, in a way that uh, was comforting to them, uh, but it was not exactly going to be worth a lot of time trying to study these things. Uh, moving to another figure, uh, Christian Gottlob Heine, whose dates are 1729 to 1812, Things change a lot. Uh, Heine moves uh, in his characterization of myth uh, quite a far piece from where, uh, from where the Enlightenment figures had it, and has uh, an interest in these mythic stories um, from a different perspective. He's actually interested in this whole ancient world. Heine is uh, an early precursor to the kind of field uh, that we study now in universities under the name of classics. Um, Heine was interested in this ancient world of the Greeks and the Romans, and he wanted to know more about it. He wanted to know everything about it he could. So he would have on his desk uh, shelf a, a kind of uh, a, a book that would help him, a reference work talking about all the geography of antiquity. Another one that might refer to all the plants and animals of antiquity. Uh, river names, place names, uh, proper names, and how people were related to one another in antiquity. There was a lot of data, background data, that Heine and his colleagues needed in order to try to understand this ancient world that they were so devoted to. Among these sets of background data, in Heine's view of things, was myth. An educated person that was trying to understand the ancient world needed to understand these ancient mythic stories. So for him, it provided a form of erudition uh, to get a background set of uh, understandings that helped him understand better the Greeks and Romans he was interested in understanding. Like geography or linguistics or biography, it gave us uh, contextual information. Now, in addition to paying a little bit closer attention to these stories, uh, Heine developed some different ideas than had gone before him. Uh, just as, or in contrast uh, to the way that Fontenelle and Hume both thought that myths grew up out of just fear at the natural surroundings and a kind of twitching attempt to come up with lame explanations for things, uh, Heine said, well, it's not just fear that's driving this. It's actually a slightly more complex kind of human reaction to the natural landscape, the reaction of awe. Now, awe is fear mixed with wonder. Uh, and Heine saw both of those things as being guiding and driving impulses in the creation of ancient myth. So human beings now are put in a position when they create myth of being in a state of both fear but also wonder at the world around them. So for him, myth is not just fear-based irrationality or misguided attempts to explain. It also grows up from an innate sense of wonder that all of us presumably, are going to feel when we, uh, when we look at great sublime kinds of features of our natural landscape. Standing at the top of a mountain, surveying a beautiful uh, stretch of the ocean or a wonderful river, uh, there's a sense of wonder that's a, a common human reaction to such a thing. Sure, maybe some fear, but also wonder too. Now, when this sense of awe arose, um, uh, Heine thought that there was some uh, uh, new dimension of human expression that had to get developed in order to express that sense of awe at the natural world. And this is something uh, that Heine said was identi identical to myth. Myth is the particular genre that human beings use to express a sense of awe at their natural surroundings. Now, for him, the category that his other Latin-speaking uh, and Latinate-speaking uh, uh, colleagues nearby uh, would have put uh, under the category of fabula or fabuli, for him, Heine, the, the fabula, fabula, that, that was just not rich enough to describe what he was talking about. He didn't mean tall tales that might have a little nugget of wisdom in them or not. Uh, he wasn't talking about that. He was talking about a something else, a spontaneous kind of human expression of amazement at the world around us. And for that, he needed a new term. Fabuli was not going to label the kind of stories he was interested in. So what he did is reach down into the Greek and pull back out that term we saw in the first uh, of our lectures, Greek term, muthos. And when he did, he bequeathed the category of myth to modern human beings. That's where myth comes from when Heine decides to revive a Greek term and bring it in a contemporary German in the term muthos 
And from there, it moves into English and Latin and French and all the other terms that have this uh, a similar term uh, for myth. Heine was doing this because uh, the Latin term that he had nearby him was just, he thought, unhelpful uh, to describe a different kind of picture that he thought these stories were fulfilling than the ones that his earlier uh, colleagues had thought. He said, sure, it's true that uh, early peoples were a little bit more irrational than you and I, and they were prone to a uh, grandiose reaction at stuff. They were uh, twitchy in that way maybe little kids are. Uh, so uh, he saw that that was a kind of characteristic of an of a earlier mentality. Their language also, Heine said, was very concrete. They did not have abstract words uh, for complex things around them, so they just pointed to concrete things to represent these uh, more abstract ideas. So myth is a concretization of abstract ideas. He thought we would find uh, um, abstractions underneath the concrete language. They're especially related to the natural landscape. So rather than talking about fear at some scary thing that happened, Heine talks about a human connection to a landscape. So when a human is in the, in the face of a certain kind of landscape, one kind of reaction is going to happen. When a human is in the face of a different kind of landscape, perhaps a different kind of reaction is going to happen. So myths now get connected to the world around them. This is an idea that carries forward uh, to the world around the people that make them up. And this is an idea that's going to carry forward in an important way um, into the thinking of our next figure uh, coming up, Johann Gottfried Herder. Herder's dates are 1744 to 1803. And Herder, as an early precursor to Romanticism, uh, carried forward this kind of reaction against the Enlightenment, uh, reacted so strongly that, in fact, he develops uh, this other view that says that, no, it's not the case that myths are just lies or wrong or um, mistakes, such as maybe my Enlightenment colleagues thought, but instead they're actually true. And not only are they true and truths, they're deeply profound truths. The most profound truths humans have to express, Herder thought, they expressed through myth. So we've got a good long piece uh, from the earlier views, and now we have an embrace of an idea that myths are uh, the most profound manifestations of the human spirit that are possible to be found. Myths, in Herder's uh, view of things, and he, his views are inherited later by the Romantics, uh, thought that myths were innate to human beings. It was a kind of innate behavioristic thing that human beings did. When faced with their natural surroundings and having these feelings of awe that came over them, myth just came out of them. It just kind of bubbled up automatically out of human beings. Um, it was further not just myth that we talked about under this category of myth, uh, uh, Herder thought. It was instead a, a larger capacity for human expression that was coming out. So myth was actually identical with poetry. Myth was identical with religion. It was identical with language. All of these things were human attempts at uh, uh, coming up and expressing uh, deep ideas that uh, resulted uh, from human beings' uh, uh, feeling of being alive. What it is to be a living, breathing creature is what we capture in our myths. So uh, we have uh, now an autonomous response uh, that is very different in Herder's view from this attempt to explain uh, that we had show up in some of the earlier uh, figures. So as we move forward, we're going to see that there are lots of different ideas on myth that developed. Uh, we've given a brief overview of some of the ancient ones and now the, the, uh, the, those from the modern era, uh, at least from the Renaissance up through the Enlightenment and into the Romantics. Um, we're going to carry forward with some uh, more contemporary views uh, specifically in this course. And when we do, we'll take a little bit of time out of our course, step back and introduce some, uh, uh, some ideas in some more detail. Before we do that, I wanted to close with some, uh, an idea about myth, a definition of myth that we'll be using as our, as our standard uh, way of talking about what we're working on in the course. Walter Burker, a still living uh, a classicist uh, uh, from Switzerland, a wonderful man, very generous man, uh, taught, has taught many of us in the field a great deal. Walter uh, was uh, born in 1931, still alive, still active as a scholarly figure, uh, writes books and articles and keeps all of us busy. Um, uh, the definition of myth that Burker comes up with is one that we'll use as a standard tried and true definition in this class. 
According to Burkert, myth is a traditional tale told with secondary partial reference to something of collective importance. I'll just repeat that. Myth is a traditional tale told with, uh, with um, secondary partial reference to something of collective importance. I want to add a coda to that, so put a comma after Burkert's definition, and this is the struck coda, told by someone for some reason. Myths don't float around in space. Remember our first slide? Uh, they're told in language by people of our species, uh, and they're told uh, by particular uh, examples of us, and they're always told for a reason. People don't do things pointlessly. Uh, they do things for a reason. Uh, so we'll use this as our rough and ready, tried and true definition when we need one in this class. And at the same time, we'll remember that all the other ideas about myth that we've been developing in these first few lectures are going to be still at the table as well. Uh, we'll keep all of them as best we can uh, in our sights. So uh, with these ideas in mind, uh, soon enough, uh, we're going to start turning to some real mythic material. We're just about ready.